we'd like to welcome all of you to the Adapting to an Inflationary Environment webinar brought to you by JDOCS, our thought leadership webinar. And you know how to use externalities to drive scenario planning in the finance organization. So we're excited to have attendees today from all over the world. We had registrants for this event spanning from 45 countries, folks from Germany to Japan to Jordan who have joined this event, you know, many different industries, energy, consulting, manufacturing, retail, and tech. So we really appreciate you joining us today. Feel free throughout the webinar to post your questions in the chat and we'll address them at the end. You know, we, the session will be recorded just so everybody's aware. You know, just a little bit backstory. You know, obviously the environment we're in, inflation has been top of mind. And so, that's really where this topic came from, is asking what's something that everybody's dealing with and how can we bring some thoughts around that to help people during planning season manner, manage this inflationary environment. So today we have with us myself, Paul Barnhurst. Many people know me as the FP&A guy if you follow me on LinkedIn. We've been to my website. And then we have also with us the Director of Solution Advisory Services for the Americas for JDOCS, Tim Cottle is with us today and he's going to be speaking to us here a little later and sharing some thoughts and some of his expertise on this subject. So what we'd like to do is we have a poll we're going to kick off for the uh, attendees here. You should see that come up on your screen here in a moment. If you guys could just go ahead and take a moment and answer the poll. The question is, how often do you revise planning assumptions about inflation? Weekly? Monthly? quarterly, semi-annual, annually, or we, have, we haven't included inflation in our planning process. So we'll leave that open for about 15 seconds here. If you could each just go ahead and answer that question, appreciate it. All right, we'll just wrap that up in a couple more seconds here. So if you haven't responded, just please go ahead and you know, give us a response so we can get an idea of how you know different audiences are planning around that. All righty, we want we'll go ahead and close the poll, and we should be able to see uh, the results here. And what we'll see is, you know, it looks like the biggest, which is a little surprising, is we have not yet to include inflation in the planning process. Is thirty six percent. It looks like twenty two percent. Our 32% is quarterly, which is the next biggest. And then there's a spread of monthly and semi-annual. You know, nobody's doing it weekly, which isn't surprising. It'd be difficult to have the data to do that. But in some volatile industries, you might see that. Energy are other things where you're constantly changing your price based on those uh, spot prices. So we're going to go ahead and go to the, uh, the next slide here. And this... What we want to highlight is just the current economic environment we're in today. And this isn't something that is new to anyone. We've all seen what's going on. And so, you know, these are different headlines over the last few months from different regions of the world, right? Inflation in the developed world, especially US, Europe, some other areas, is something we haven't seen at this level in 40 years. In addition to that, we're seeing big changes in FX rates, the euro and the US dollars at parity. Japanese yen at a 40-year low against the euro. So we're seeing a lot of change in the economic environment. We're also seeing, you know, real concerns about inflation, or not inflation, um, uh, a recession due to raising interest rates to fight inflation that we're experiencing. And so there's a quote I want to share from uh, the Fed chairman for the U.S. Fed, Jerome Powell. I think it's a real compelling quote he gave about the environment we're in. He says. Price stability is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve as the bedrock of our economy. So it serves as the bedrock of our economy. Without price stability, the economy does not work for anyone. The burdens of high inflation fall heaviest on those who are least able to bear them. And I think that really sums up where we're at. And so, you know, we have our professional of dealing with the inflation, where we need to figure out for work of how to manage it. We also have the personal impact. Many of us feel it every time we go to the grocery store. You know, my wife does most of the shopping and I went and did some grocery shopping the other day and I'm like, wait, prices have gone up this much? You know, it was just, it was shocking to me. Or you go fill up the tank and it's costing you double what it did two years ago. And so we're all feeling that challenge 
and it's a difficult economic environment. And, you know, we definitely have some challenges ahead of us. So let's talk a little bit just quickly. How did we end up here before we jump into some of these externalities and how we think of planning around them? Right. We've had the global pandemic. You look at COVID and now we're going from a pandemic to an endemic. And we have to think about what does that mean? We're also coming into another health crisis, right? You've seen monkeypox. There's other things. I think uh, the World Health Organization called that a global health crisis, not a pandemic, but it's still something we need to be aware of. Geopolitical conflict, right? Wars that are going on have had a huge strain on different commodities, on prices, on energy. Then you just have the energy crisis from you know, efforts to fight climate, climate change, from a push to going to renewable energy, and other decisions that are being made. You have cyber attacks, trade winds, you know, other things like that. And that's be cyber attacks example becoming a bigger concern is everybody re works remote, right? We all went from primarily an in-office workforce to a remote workforce overnight to who knows what it's gonna be going forward. So I'm gonna be remote, online, hybrid. All of this puts strain on the finance and the planning department. I know for me during COVID, that was some of the most stressful months for work that I've ever had of every day coming in and what's our cash like? Okay, how do we save these expenses? Are we gonna have to let go of people? You know, what furloughs are we doing? And it was just, you know, really intense and challenging. And so it, it puts a complexity and a challenge on the finance department to be dealing this environment. And that's why we're hopeful what we go through here will give you guys some ideas to help you as you're planning and thinking about inflation. So if we go to the next slide here, there's really three externalities we wanna focus on that you should be thinking about in your scenario planning. And you know, there can be multiples of these, but these are the three we'll focus on here. So you have inflation, which I call the elephant in the room today, right? You pretty much have to be uh, tone deaf and not turning on the TV, not doing anything to not realize it's a major problem. Second is interest rates. Now, one of the biggest tools governments have, banks, central banks, to fight inflation is to increase interest rates. Well, increasing interest rates slows investment, often leads to recession. So you have to think of how do we manage both those environments? And the next, what does all this change and this uncertainty do to FX rates, especially if you're a global company? If you're used to getting one exchange rate, now it's 20% lower or 20% higher, what does that do to my business, right? Being, what does that do to things I'm purchasing? So let's go ahead and talk specifically about inflation. And what we wanna start with is just showing a historic trend, kind of where we're at today, where we've been at for the last 10 years. So what we're gonna see here on this chart is it's only a couple countries, you know, and we pick some throughout the globe. So some in Asia, Europe, you know, North America, to kind of give us an idea. And what we're gonna see for the most part, inflation has been relatively stable for the last, you know, roughly 13 years. You see a little bit of a drop here of deflation toward the beginning of the pandemic. But what you see is it's pretty stable. And then all of a sudden a hockey stick, right? Every single country here with one exception has had a pretty sharp increase. And so that's the environment we're in today. You know, historically, I will admit when I planned, you know, two years ago, three years ago, 10 years ago, usually it was, oh, I'll just assume two, 3% for inflation. We might have spent two minutes talking about it and then we moved on to everything else. It was just a simple assumption. That's no longer sufficient, right? Companies and CEOs need to be given thought to it. That dramatic change in inflation and the fact that it's no longer transitory as we kept hearing, oh, it will go away once supply chain eases up, right? We've had over a year of inflation now and the last few months, high inflation, we often need to reassess our strategy. So we'll talk about what that means and how companies manage in this environment, right? And so one thing we want to talk about is not only do we have to think about what it means that inflation rates are going up, but what, you know, what are people forecasting? So here we can see, you know, 2020 to 2022, what's happened, right? All sharply up. We can see it here in the table, you know, going from 2020 where inflation was pretty much irrele irrelevant, right? If you ignored it, for almost all these countries, the impact would be minimal. Then in 2021, all right, bigger impact. Then in 2022, substantial impact. And some of these numbers are the IMF's forecast. What we're actually seeing is higher than this. 
You know, U.S. I think is around nine percent right now. Most of Europe's in that range, and so, you know, how do we prepare and plan for that environment? And then we have the challenge of not only thinking about it today, but for the next couple of years. Here's what the IMF thinks will happen: is this increasing interest rates will push that inflation back down, and that's where scenario planning, which we're going to get into more detail, is so important, right? Because the IMF originally thought these curves were going to be lower. So what that means is we have to be thinking not only what does that mean for my business today, this environment? What is it, what's it going to be in one year and two years? And planning both for what if it continues? What if inflation doesn't come down like is expected? And then also planning in scenarios, what happens if inflation does come down? right? We can no longer just have a point estimate for our planning. We really need to be thinking through these things. And in talking to that, I just want to talk a little bit about the global environment to talk about thinking through things and understanding how inflation impacts different regions. This shows it really is a global concern. I really like this graph. Unfortunately, you know, they didn't have data for every country. But what you can clearly see is the darker the blue, the bigger the inflation. And you know, you look here through North America, South America, Australia, all through Europe, you can see how much inflation is is happening right now, how big of an issue it is. This was just first quarter of 2022. If we took third quarter, we'd probably see even a darker blue. And then what we have here is just how big of an impact it's been. So the inflation rate is an example in Israel, which was the first one here has increased 20 to, 25 times since the first quarter of 2022. You know, Spain, it's up 12 times. You know, US is about six, five, six times, all the way down to China, which so far has managed to have little inflation. If any, you know, any region that's probably done the be, has managed the best as far as dealing with inflation, it's been Asia. And we see that in these numbers. But inflation is a global concern. It used to be often it was uh, more regionalized, but our economy is so interconnected now that you know inflation is hard to tame and it quickly spreads. It's kind of like a contagion or a pandemic, right? Quickly spread throughout the globe. So that's where we're at. So let's talk a little bit as we're planning and thinking about inflation. Now we talked a little bit about scenario planning and we'll talk more about that. But I really like this graph because it highlights the complexity of inflation. So first, this is the Eurozone. This is what they call a harmonized index. So there are a number of different index that can be used. This is the one that Europe uses, where it harmonizes it across the Eurozone countries. In the US, you'll see it called CPI and some others. But what you're gonna see here, and what I wanna highlight, is look how different the range is. Malta, 6.1%. And this is for the month of June. Estonia, 22% for that year to date inflation. And Europe as a whole, 8.6. So you can see from the graph, it's different in all these countries. Not only is that different, but the next thing that we really want to point out and that we have to be thinking about is it's so different between different commodities and different products, right? If I, if I operate in the education space, education is actually seeing a slight amount of deflation this year. So it's flat, right? Probably not the right time to raise prices if uh, you know, overall that's what we're seeing in that industry. Now, again, that depends on labor and some other things, but take energy, right? If I run in housing, electricity, gas at 17%, probably have no choice but to raise my prices and need to be thinking about what inputs I have that are going to deal with this type of price increase. And you see everything in between. You know, and so the reality is inflation rates are complex, especially in an uncertain environment like we are today. Many different indexes exist. And at the back of the presentation, which you guys will get, is there's resources for all the major indexes that are out there for you know the Eurozone, UK, US, um, IMF, some different data that you can use to help with that. So we need to focus on those core drivers. What is driving the inflation in our business? For many of us, that's gonna be labor, cost of good inputs. Sometimes it may be some other things, but what are those external factors? 
And then in an inflationary environment, the reason it's so important that we do some scenario planning, we business partner with the business and really have a whole so holistic plan for this is the cost of making mistakes in an inflationary environment, especially one with increasing interest rates, is more expensive. And the prime example is we've just seen a lot of retail, particularly Target and Walmart, but others as well, that had to discount a lot of goods because they overstocked certain type of goods substantially. And to move them so they didn't have all this excess inventory and cash you know, tied up in inventory, they had to substantially discount them. Now, when the holidays come and they need to rebuy some of those goods, they're going to be buying them at a higher price because of inflation. So the impact, one, they got lower margins because they overbought, and then they're going to get hit again on the other side because of the cost. So, you know, it's important to remember that you're going to have to, there are many times where you need to do research, especially if you're a global company. It's not simple to just, you know, look at one, one rate and assume that's good for your business. I'm going to turn it to Tim here. He's going to talk to us about interest rates and a few other things. All right. Thanks, Paul. And, and just a note, um, Phoebe was supposed to present some of these slides and uh, came down with an illness. Illness, And I think that uh, speaks to the subject at hand, right? We, we need to be ready to react to the unknown and, and to be a little bit more cognizant of of a, of a fast moving world. And, and we're gonna talk a little bit about how we um, handle that. Uh, but specifically, you know, the topics that Paul talked about, but uh, uh, also this, interest rates. And these things are intertwined, of course, right? None of this happens in a silo, which I think is a key takeaway as well. Um, if you can see the interest rates uh, on the graphs, they are skyrocketing in, in response mainly to inflation, right? So, you know, it's going to cause, um, a change, a shift in how we think about uh, funds and borrowing, uh, as well as other things. And uh, it's interesting, you know, at, at least here in the U.S., and I know we have a very global uh, um, audience today, but for example, the Fed's fund rate has been near zero for years. So it's not something we've even had to think about. Um, so it's, it's an interesting dynamic, something that has changed, probably maybe isn't even in our financial modeling because it wasn't a huge issue for so long. It's becoming an issue. It's becoming something that we need to uh, talk about, plan for, okay? So um, a couple ways to deal with this, um, we, we can bring up on the screen. So of course, you know, inflation leads to what we see in these graphs, rising interest rates. Um, and, and a collaborative approach is necessary here, right? Because uh, these rates impact lots of different things. Of course, they cascade through to the bottom line. But when you think about teammates and treasury and other parts of the business, um, making sure that you tap into their knowledge about what that's going to do to, you know, capital management strategies, for example, that could really change the outlook uh, depending on your business. Uh, some businesses will be way more sensitive this, to this than others. Um, so the idea is to understand these externalities that are changing. And of course, you know, our job as finance folks is, is figuring out how to plan for it. Uh, not not just you know a five percent bump in sales, but a five percent bump in sales plus the cost of capital to to make the things and everything cascades all the way through your P and L. Okay. Um, another uh, topic that I think is is important to talk a little bit about is foreign exchange rates. So again, highly dependent on uh, what currencies you operate in, where you operate in the world. Uh, but exchange rates have been fluctuating quite a bit as well. Um, here we're focusing in on, on uh, GBP versus USD, uh, but the euro, you know, the euro has, has, is, is near parity with the US dollar uh, recently, right? So, so changes here as well. And so uh, similarly, you know, we need to think just like with interest rates, how do we react to plan uh, for foreign exchange issues and currency? because it does definitely impact uh, certain businesses heavily. You know, if you're buying, sourcing things all over with the global supply chain, uh, you need to build these things in. And, and they're becoming more and more variable as, as central bankers try to pull levers to uh, uh, combat inflation, right? And so all of these things are intertwined. So what do we do with foreign exchange rates? Uh, similarly um, to um, the um, interest rates, um, we have to take into account this volatility. We just have to. Um, you know, it's, it's becoming more complex, and we'll talk about some strategies how to deal with all these complexities in a little bit. Um, but FX rate 
FX rate volatility, the biggest tool you can use to account for it, to plan for it, is really scenario planning. It, it's, it's extremely variable. There's so many factors that play into to how currencies match up together. Uh, and then you throw government activities into that uh, a fishbowl of variables and it becomes difficult. So the idea of you know bands of outcomes, scenarios, what if it goes up, what if it goes down, and insulating your business to those shocks. And, and that's the key part, right? So trying to forecast up and down is great, but you're never gonna pick out what the exact FX rate is in three months. That's just not gonna happen. So what we need to do is say, okay, if this happens, this is what will happen to our business. And so if you have two choices to make, and they're 2% apart, and they seem equally good, if one of them mitigates FX risks a little bit better in this environment, maybe that's a scenario you wanna plan for, instead of just going with the best bottom line number. So, so you know, we get into other topics, and I, and I won't belabor it too much, but uh, you know, supply chain disruptions, FX rates, all of these things are coming together, and it's been becoming more complex, and we need to, to cover more bases as far as how we're gonna to react to things and have playbooks in place. So if, if FX, FX rates or, or interest rates go way up or way down, we have the best plan to react to that. And all the way through the ecosystem with, from vendors to, to customers, how are we gonna to react to these things to smooth things out? You know, hedging activities, uh, sourcing things from multiple locations, for example. Uh, these are some decisions that uh, scenario planning can help us make, okay? All right, so here, we just wanted to show a simple example to highlight kind of what many companies, many of us have done historically, which is, hey, just take whatever the you know inflation rate is, and I just use 9%, say that's what it is for 2023. Hopefully it will be lower than that, but taking what we're currently seeing and saying, all right, if I leave my revenue the same and I apply that to all my cost of goods, where do I end up? We can see in this case, it's a 5% erosion and just gross profit margin. We're not even going all the way down to net income. Right. But then what I did in scenario two is I said, all right, what's the real increases I'm seeing to my different products? Like way, okay, that's heavily impacted by the geopolitical conflicts we're seeing. We can't get those shipments in. It's a third, it's costing us 35% more. You know, freight is costing us 25% more. Now all of a sudden we have a 32% gross profit margin. And so it's really important that we think through each line item and what those assumptions should be for material line items. Right, you know, packaging is a you know pretty small amount. Maybe we're okay just taking an average rate, but we need to think through the those things, and then we need to come up with that strategy, which is what we'll talk about. We talk about scenario planning, but what are those things we can do to make sure we're optimizing this environment for the business that we're getting the best return we can? And so, right, this has had a huge impact as we've talked about about before on finance. The number of forecasts have increased by nearly 50% is what I've heard according to the AFP, right? Since the beginning of the pandemic. So many of us are working later night, nights, we're working longer, we're more stressed. Then you add to that, that they're less satisfied with the work we're doing, right? So you're working more and the forecasts are less accurate. Not, not a fun environment for anyone. I mean, the, AF, the FP&A trend survey for 2022 showed we went from 54 to 39%. They're asking us to bring in more external data. You know, so there's a number of different things happening in the businesses. They're expecting us to coordinate and help drive change more. So if this is the environment we're in, we're going to talk about, you know, spend the rest of the time here talking about what do we do? What are the key things that can really help us manage in such an uncertain and inflationary environment, both for finance, you know, for FP&A, for planning? So next, we're going to do a quick poll. We have here to ask some questions and then we'll uh, continue the presentation. So the question is, are you currently using external drivers in your planning and forecasting? And so go ahead and just select there. You have four options. Yes, always. Yes, sometimes. No, but we plan on adding them in the future. Or no, not using them. Don't have any plans. So we'll give you about 20 seconds here. If you guys can each just go through and select your answer on the poll. Okay, we'll give another uh, another five seconds or so, and then we'll wrap the, the poll up and see the results. All right. 
So what we can see is it looks like, you know, the biggest use is sometimes. So we're definitely taking them into consideration. Uh, the next biggest is 30% is saying no, but we plan to at some point. And then yes, always about one in five. And then no, and no plans to add external drivers is about one in six. All right, so interesting. So we can see a spread there, but there's definitely, you know, the two biggest numbers we saw there is around, yep, sometimes, and we plan on doing it. So if we go to the next slide here, what the what we're going to talk about is the three key tools that you really need in this environment. And so one is technology. And what's interesting is companies that use technology, whether it's cloud-based or AI, and those surveys showed they had much uh, more confidence in their forecast. So technology is a big part of it. Second is business partnering. You know, finance can't be back office anymore. Finance really needs to be front and center and adding value. And then the third one is around sensitivity and scenario planning. And so uh, Tim's going to talk a little bit about uh, technology here for us. Yeah, so, you know, we just hit you with a lot of facts. There's a lot of things changing in the world. Um, the velocity of planning is increasing. You know, that, that Paul, I think that was really pertinent. You know, we're doing more work and it's being appreciated less. And that's a really tough spot to be in. And I think the the genesis of of that issue, um, you know, which which we can all uh, feel, I think, right now, is lack of technology. So making investments into your finance organization to equip them to handle some of these externalities and other things that we've been talking about, and you know, the need for technology as you are being tasked with planning more uh, skyrockets. The need for technology is then compounded. By the fact that things are changing faster and things are a little bit more unpredictable so having more granular plans are, are needed also so not just more forecasts but more complexity uh, more often um, is a tough thing to do and and, and what will happen is um, if you haven't invested in technology you'll really start to stress um, not only their business but but people I mean if you think about a finance department these are great folks, really smart folks that, that have a lot to give to the business from a consultative standpoint. Um, but if they're just churning spreadsheets all day, every day, I mean, what kind of value are they really adding, right? So, so you're taking somebody who went to school maybe for you know, many years and took a class or two on, on Excel or, or some other tools, um, and, and if that's all they do, uh, that, that's a big miss. And so um, technology can help a lot. So the first point, and I think Paul mentioned this earlier, is data, uh, both external and internal data. So, you know, over the last decade, you know, talking to thousands of finance professionals, internal data uh, has been an issue to try to connect and use and collaborate with, okay? But we're asking you to not only do that well, get data that's outside of your company and incorporate it also. And, and so it becomes clear very quickly that, that if you don't invest in technology, your head will explode. The, the data sets are, are, are growing at a vast pace. And so um, some of the things that we have used and developed and recommend to help account for some of these things uh, is, if, is investments in technology, right? And it's the third data point I, I'm talking about in a second, but that's okay. Um, the idea here is equip your people with tools to unlock their abilities as business consultants and, and, and obliterate busy work, okay? Uh, and, and when you get those tools, it opens the window to start adding all of these complexities that we've talked about as well in much faster, less uh, personally and, and business disruptive ways, okay? Um, one of the big advancements over the last decade or so is, is AI and machine learning. So artificial intelligence, machine learning. I would add maybe predictive analytics in there as well. People using more sophisticated techniques and tools to to, cra to 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 grapple with these issues that we've been talking about, and uh, we'll double click on on AI in a moment. Uh, but again, planning. I think I think the takeaway here, you know, before the pandemic, before the inflation and inflation activity, everybody was still talking to me about planning more, scenario planning, rolling forecasting. Quarterly planning, even before this volatility, was not really getting it done for a lot of businesses. Now, some businesses are, are, are don't move around as much, and that's fine, and 
and you know you it right sizing things to your organization is also important um but planning more often uh is not new planning more collaboratively with the business is not new but those desires and and needs have just been accelerated it's it, it's going like this you you're, you know there are businesses that are really struggling to react to these things and the ones that have already invested in technology are handling it quite a bit better and, and paul that statistic uh that you brought up a little while ago about people with technology you know being more satisfied with their plans uh that that's why they can plan faster better and more granularly frankly okay so let's let's double click on some of these things so the the first um the the first barrier to success right in, in a lot of ways is unwillingness to change okay if you watch sport sports or anything else everybody is consistently trying to up their game right and and you've see, you've heard of of golfers changing their swing on the PGA tour you've heard of of you know uh somebody changing the way they they do you know whatever the formations in soccer you, you know you get it but the idea is not changing uh is is also a choice i think there's a a famous uh line if you choose not to decide you have made a choice and i think the same applies if you choose not to change you are actually adding risk and and what i mean by that is change can be scary but what is scarier is sticking your head in the sand and not dealing with change and so i think it's clear that there's there's a need for change um if you're someone that struggles to em em embrace uh change this is a real thing and i don't want to to dismiss it right it's scary to change it's hard to change you you break out of these paths that we've been on and it causes stress quite frankly however right now we feel that it's necessary okay um the next one it speaks more to the technology and tools and so that first one was was just was just an encouragement to to be open to these things um and a lot of you already are and you don't you don't need that encouragement and that's fine uh but when we talk about these new tools one of the ones that everyone has talked about for many years is ai right we've known that it's been coming we, we've known that it's been on the horizon uh forever it feels like in, in my career um and because we've been talking about it for so long i mean decades right or a decade anyway um a lot of people have the idea that it's in the future right and 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 i think when we think about all of the interesting potential that ai has there's certainly things in the future right but ai in the context of what we're talking about uh is is mature it's been used for years now and is adding value in lots of corporations and organizations across the globe and we'll, we'll, we'll show you some examples of some of the things you can do with it in a moment uh, but it's here and it's ready to be used and it can help you with these topics and, and other topics frankly People were implementing this before the pandemic uh, to try to react quicker to, to different things in their businesses. Um, connected to that and crucial is the concern that I'll lose my job because of AI. And I've, and I've heard this, and, and there's a few things that I would like to tell you to try to, to, try to um, reassure you about this. One, um, when they came out with the automated teller machine, you know, the ATM machine to get your cash out, everybody thought, oh my, banking employees are gonna be out of work. Well, there are more banking employees now by orders of magnitude than there were back then. So it clearly didn't hurt that job market. I've been doing uh, financial technology implementations um, after my career leading finance teams for, for many, many years. And I've, I've been, been on hundreds of projects. And when I first started that career, I was concerned too. It was like, am I going to give people tools to let people go? Almost never has that happened in my in my almost two decade career what happens is we unlock the potential of those folks to do their jobs better and ai i, I we've seen in the marketplace doing the same it, it's not something that says oh we don't need finance people anymore it's actually just the opposite finance people have better tools now and they are more um uh more than ever uh relied upon and these new tools will make you more relied upon because it'll be more valuable and more consultative and our current scenario planning is enough maybe um but a lot of folks on the call aren't aren't building some of these things into their plans and maybe in your business that's okay uh however we feel like scenario planning is key 
when you don't, you know, we're tasked with predicting the future, right? That's that's really what finance people do. We predict the future, we help make decisions. Um, the more information you can provide about different paths of possibilities, uh, and then overlaying uh, machine learning and some intuition to to kind of score those things and, and build them into your plans are key. And again, I'm not going to criticize anybody uh, for not planning enough, but I will tell you that most of the people who come talk to me have that desire. They want to plan more often. Okay, let's move along. All um, right. So, yep. Yeah. So here we see on business partnering, you know, finance must plan and partner with the business. This idea of planning in a silo, which has been a challenge, and I've seen it in my career, is just going to get us in trouble. If you're sitting in your spreadsheet all day, you're doing it wrong. That's just the reality. Or even if you're sitting with technology, technology is the enabler. Say you have great tools. That only enables you to be a better business partner. It doesn't solve your problem, the fundamental problem. It should free up time, allow you to streamline and automate. So I think that's important to remember with technology. The area we, where we really make the difference is in partnering with the business. So what are some of the things we can do in an inflationary environment? Now make sure we're running sensitivity analysis. So this is different from scenarios. Scenarios are, hey, the recession's coming. What do I do? What are the triggers that allow me to start acting under that scenario? Or, you know, inflation's gonna continue for the next five years. Well, what should I put in place because of that? Versus, hey, what happens to this major input if energy goes up 5%. So being able to quickly sensitize it and understand those different areas and build scenarios. Next is everybody should be looking at their product portfolios. If you're not, you're missing an opportunity within your pricing strategy. Maybe there's some products that you should cancel. In this environment, but they're not profitable. You're not really in a market where you can raise the, the price to make them profitable. It may be a great time to recommend to the business, hey, maybe we should kill this. Or maybe there's something where if you bundle it a certain way, you can get a, extract a lot more value. So you need to help the business make sure that analysis is going on. And don't be afraid to raise prices for financial help. I mean, nobody likes to raise prices, but the reality is studies have shown, and I wish I had the uh, study, but I saw it in a presentation somebody did, that executives overestimate the volume decline multiple times from what really happened. So it was like three or four times more. So if you say the decline is going to be 10% for my price increase, reality often shows it's two or three. Now, obviously, there's a limit to that. It doesn't mean you can triple your price and everybody's going to still buy. You know, and that's where that analysis comes in. Expenses, you know, zero-based budgeting. Make people justify everything. Make sure you're looking at your licenses and they're actually being used. And that you don't have overlap in product. You know, prime example, I worked for a company where we had Teams, then we had Slack, then we had Zoom, and then we had some phone system that we could use on our computer. And I'm like, all right, why are we paying for four different products when we probably could have boiled that down to one, maybe two? You know, it's because everybody had different ownership and they wanted their system. That's inefficient. So look for those opportunities and bring them up to the business. You know, work with the business. If you're a larger organization, work with risk specifically to understand what they see as the biggest risks and make sure you spend time planning in that area. And then the final, which we emphasized before, and we'll go through examples, so I won't belabor this one, because Tim's gonna show us a little bit on this, is scenario planning. So I'll turn it back over to you, Tim. All right, thank you. Okay, so let's jump in. And, and when we talk about, um, when we talk about some of these topics, uh, scenario planning, we talked about technology, and as you know, sometimes it's better just to see it, see it in action. So we're gonna talk about AI, and we're gonna talk about scenario planning in the context of financial software. So this is the Jedox software. It offers a wide range of capabilities to do integrated financial planning, but it also has a very usable, accessible AI engine. Uh, we call it assist AI-assisted planning. And we've taken a wizard-based approach so that finance people have these AI-enabled tools at their disposal to build them into their plans. And we're gonna see that in action. But I think one important concept in technology, at least modern technology, 
is the ability for um, the users to control their own destiny. And that's why we've done these wizard-based uh, approaches so that finance people can access, set up, and use uh, AI and machine learning in their, in their jobs. Um, it's, it's not something that you need a data science department for anymore, I guess is, is what I'm getting at. And so when you think about technology investments, make sure that they are uh, accessible and easy to use. You know, uh, we don't want to send our finance folks to get data science degrees uh, simply to use a tool. And, and, and so um, that, that's why this is set up that way. So let's, let's take a look at it in action. I'm going to go to a different screen. Um, this is a strategic planning screen, a scenario planning screen. This is connected to the full P&L uh, with all the fund drivers and, and driver-based planning uh, that's set up uh, for this environment. But this is a place where you know a CFO, a finance VP, uh, or, or really anybody who needs to in the organization can come and, and try to predict what's going on uh, next year. Try to do some scenarios. Try to build in some ideas and some plans to make uh, things you know uh, a little more tight when it comes to to predicting how the next year is going to be. Now, how does AI interact with this, right? Because probably most of you have done some sort of scenario planning before. Well. Based on those templates that, we, that, that I've shown you, I've, I've enabled two different parts of the AI engine. So the first one I'll bring up is the driver analysis. So this is where we can look at both internal and external data and connect it to our plan. So the system is, is looking at all types of data. So consumer price index forecasts, for example, FX volatility, how does this interact with your business? I mentioned earlier when we were talking about FX that depending on where you buy things and how you do things, it could impact a bunch or, or not a lot. This will make those connections for you. So it's scoring the different drivers that it has access to and applying them to the, the full scope of the data of your business so that we can make better predictions. And the idea here is to increase the use of drivers and, and, and to, to a point that would be almost undoable in Excel because there would just be too many connections, okay? And the idea is, is leveraging a machine to make more connections uh, while at the same time making your job uh, not, um, you know, cranking through things manually, okay? So when we've identified drivers and, and based on forecasts and, and history and, and, you know, working together, we can use that data and have it overlay and interact with our internal data. So now we're going to take those drivers, we're going to take some information about our past and how we've performed, you know, uh, you know how things are going, and organize that data into a plan, okay? So this is where we're going to do, uh, use some predictive analytics, uh, layered in with some really smart machine learning AI topics to use all kinds of different um, methodologies, right? to figure out an upper, lower, and expected bound of how we're gonna perform uh, for a whole P&L, okay? You could do this simply for sales as well, uh, but, but this is a way we're gonna take all of this information and the machine is going to predict the future. And it's doing a lot of interesting things. You can see this check mark over on the left. It's actually looking at the data that we're feeding into it and grading it and, and, and raising its hand and saying, hey, uh, here's a prediction, but it's, it's, it's you know, not great because you don't have enough data. And so even the data preparation, taking out outliers so it doesn't swing things wildly up and down are all included in this. And, and so at the end of the day, what we end up with is a strategic or predicted plan, okay? Upper bound, our lower bound, and our expected. So we've got this full plan. Again, it's a full P&L plan. It's not just you know, one line in this, in this specific use case. And we can use it. Now, if you're doing a bottoms up plan, you can use this um, as, as a sanity check or, or just a, 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 to look to see if, if the plan that people have built up makes sense based on what the machine is saying. Um, or you can actually use it as the basis of a plan. So you can seed a budget or, or a forecast with this information. It's portable data. And so when someone comes up to do a bottoms up budget, maybe they start with the AI plan. Some people use it. Uh, and, and use it as their plan, and then make people explain themselves if they vary from it uh, to a certain amount. And that's a little bit more mature organization that's, that's learned to trust the technology a little bit. What I mean about it being portable though, is now we can use this in our scenario plan. So down here, 
we're going to start doing some scenario planning. We'll do a strategic plan, and then we'll do a best case and a worst case. And we're only doing three, uh, but the idea with technology like this, you could do as many plans as you want, and we can put the ability uh, for, for people to do hundreds of scenarios if needed, um, but we'll just stick to three uh, for simplicity. So as we're planning out you know, what we want to do for the next year, we can start with our basis. So for our strategic plan, I'm going to start with the predicted amounts uh, from up here. For our worst case plan, I'm going to do the same. But for our best case plan, I'm going to say, well, maybe the AI was uh, wrong, or maybe it wasn't building in some things that I know that aren't in the data. And I'm going to go with last year's numbers. Okay, so we have a lot of ability to set our basis, um, to pick what makes sense. And by the way, if you needed to adjust these things in your basis, that's that's something that could happen too. Uh, but again, we want, don't want to get bogged down too much in, in the details just yet. And then, um, this is a key section. Nobody, uh, and, and, and hopefully this is clear, nobody on the call is, is advocating replacing uh, knowledge with AI. It's, it's really augmenting what we know. So for example, AI might not be able to predict that you had a call with the supplier and they're going to raise prices 5%. That's a number you can build into the plan. Maybe it can predict something in that vein, but you know the number. So we're going to build certain things into the plan and, and raise those numbers up and down. So the first one is a price increase. And, and right now I have zero listed as a price increase. Um, so let's go tell the system what we're going to do. So based on our current prices, our PL might look something like this, the impact of the PL, I should say. Um, so what we can simply do is go and say, okay, well, if we raise our prices by 5%, and we can see that cascade through the PL, um, this is my best guess. And we can comment on it and, and you could get more complex if you wanted to. And now what we can do is say, okay, strategically in best case, I'm going to build this price increase into my plan and see what it does. And if, if you can see these numbers moving around down here, all the way through my PL. Uh, similarly, for worst case, you know, maybe there's a project delay because of Corona, so we can add that in. So, uh, and, and adding new initiatives in here uh, is as simple as clicking a button and building in what you think the impact is going to be. Again, you could you could actually also apply AI to to some parameters and in an initiative as well. But the idea is taking um, information that uh, only lives in in people. And when we talked earlier about business collaboration and things like that. That's where we get this information in building it into a plan. So right now I've got full P&Ls uh, for my predicted, my strategic, my best case, my worst case. And, if, and, and what's great is this is cascading down into detailed plans and reports so that I can look uh, with great granularity, with visuals, exactly what's going to happen. And if I see something I don't like here in the final report that maybe I'm going to submit to my boss, maybe I go in here and make a change. Or maybe I add another initiative to get this in shape uh, as, as I need it. So again, the idea is simple to use tools so that you can be freed uh, to build in your intuition, to build in your initiatives uh, into the plan, and to utilize technology better in really easy ways uh, to free you up to, to do some of these complex and difficult tasks that, that Paul and I have been talking about. Um, important to note here, and I mentioned this earlier, all of these numbers do not live in a silo. If you want to take bits and pieces of these plans and put them out there and do a bottoms up plan to say, hey, in this scenario, production uh, folks, what does it look like for your department? And so this becomes an enabler of planning better. And software like this is highly collaborative too. And we could talk about that uh, in the future if you ever want to, uh, about bringing you know, end users and folks on the shop floor, if you will, into the planning process uh, because these, these intuitions and initiatives and things uh, don't live in data sometimes, and we want to get uh, the information as best as possible. So that was fast. However, um, it's important to know that uh, technology is out there, technology is accessible, the technology is mature, and it is ready to, to use in your organizations. And, and just a real quick story about uh, that, because me telling you is, is hopefully good. I, I hope uh, I'm, I am a trustworthy guy. However, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. Uh, Let's, let's talk about a use case where somebody's actually using a tool similar to what I just showed you in your business, and that's Apex Hotels. So a large uh, hotel company in, in the UK, um, they you know, wanted to forecast more. They wanted to build in more information. They wanted to grab different drivers. They wanted to use advanced uh, statistics and analytics to, to better forecast. And so they've actually implemented the technology I just showed you 
Um, they've saved vast amounts of time in their finance organization. Um, they're able to react faster. They can actually start predicting things automatically and, and highlighting issues uh, that you can deal with and understand. Uh, it's not a case anymore of, okay, the month is closed. I'm going to take this data from three weeks ago and use it to plan a year in advance. They're constantly course correcting, uh, as you would if you were driving a car, with this technology. And their accuracy is up, uh, up. their accuracy is up to 97%. And um, it's, been, it's been widely adopted in this organization and shown great, uh, great success. And so we can talk more about these. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll adjourn that part now for time. The idea, again, is it's, it's uh, people out there that you can talk to are using this technology. And the folks that started using it before the pandemic and all these changes were in a really great position to react very quickly as these things uh, in our environment change. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. So you know, just to reemphasize what we've talked about here is, you know, first is technology. We need to take advantage of what's out there today to enable us to free up time. Sure, could you do a bunch of externalities in a spreadsheet? Yes, you can. But is that the best use of your time when something else may be able to do it in minutes? So think about how you can utilize technology to enable you to free up your time to partner more, more with the business, to really be there and help them mitigate risks and make sure that we're following the right strategies. And third, that final one that's really important is that scenario planning. You need to more than ever in an uncertain environment have multiple scenarios and have planned what's the trigger point is. When am I gonna implement scenario one versus two versus three? When do I change course? You know, and I take time to think about that. And again, the technology will help with the, that scenario planning, but this all hinges and why you see it in the middle is business partnering. It's about working with the business. And so we're gonna go ahead now and we have a couple minutes left. I know we're close to the top of the hour. Open it up to questions. I think we have one question here and Tim, I'm gonna throw this question over to you. My manager is afraid that AI will be too disruptive to our existing processes. How do you recommend I convince them it's worth evaluating? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and you know, it goes to that fear of change or, or um, you know, uh, kind of concept we talked about. So I think a story is the best way to answer this question. You know, how we've implemented AI over the years uh, often it starts in a silo and they'll run it, not, not in a data silo, but, but not necessarily connected to the plans they produce and present to, to, the, to, the, to the board. Um, it, it's used as a gut check at first because they want to vet out how accurate it can be over time, but they're not quite there yet to trust it, right? You know, um, and what happens is over time, people trust it more and more and begin to run it more and more heavily. So I, I, would, uh, I would slowly acclimate your manager to these concepts in a non-threatening way saying, hey, this is another um, statistical tool that we can use to understand our plans better, to understand our environment better. And it's, it's, it's here and we can use it. And I think just showing them the value of it that way in a non-threatening, non-disruptive way is a good way to, to start your journey. And you'll be surprised how quickly they embrace it as they start seeing the accuracy of the, of the predictions and things like that. Um, and if you need some help, we're, we're happy to help too in showing, you know, some use cases and, and how this can actually help. You can also use the use it on old data. Uh, so pretend that you're predicting something that that's already happened and see how it lines up, right? Um, and so we can we can shield the, the AI from data that that you know that we don't want it to take into account. And so you can actually pressure test how accurate this can be. And I think that non-disruptive uh, additive approach. Also, with showing the accuracy uh, can really help a lot in, in convincing somebody to adopt uh, AI technology like this. Thank you for that answer, Tim. And that makes a lot of sense to be able to test it and prove it out before you just put it in place and all of a sudden realize, ah, it wasn't as accurate as I thought. Yeah. Right. So great question there. It doesn't look like at this time there's any other questions, but we do have one other question it looks like.
Yeah, so can the JDOC's assisted planning software be integrated with the ERP systems like SAP? So I'll let Tim answer that. Yeah, so it can interact with the SAP data. I would say that. And, and so there's some data strategy discussions you'd want to have there. The short answer is absolutely. We can take it and look at the SAP data and synthesize, synthesize some plans. As I said, um, all data is really on the table. So if you want to get third party forecasts, data from your ERP, uh, data from uh, you know your CRM, it's all it's all available to use. It's all something that, that we've done in the past and actually encourage. You, you need to look at as much data as you can. The, the more data that the AI engine uh, interacts with, the, the better the predictions are. So uh, absolutely in play. All right, well, thank you, Tim. Looks like that was our last question we had and we're right at the top of the hour. So we're gonna go ahead and thank everybody for attending today. We really appreciate you taking an hour of your time. And if you have any further questions, maybe after the webinar, you think of something you wanna ask, feel free to reach out to myself. It's Paul Barnhurst. You can find me at the uh, email address here in the deck. And then also you can reach out to Tim at his email address. We're both happy to answer any questions. We appreciate you taking the time and joining us to get today. Again, thank you for uh, spending some time with us. And you know, we hope the plan goes well for all of you and that you're able to you know, find ways to implement some of the things we've recommended today to improve your processes. So thank you for joining us. Thank you.